You're listening to The Drag. That's the sound of an egg rubbing all around my body. My dad's the one with the egg. Yeah, he's rubbing an actual store-bought refrigerated egg all over my body, going from the tip of my toes to the very top of my head. My dad is performing what my family calls a cura, which is a type of spiritual cleansing, or limpia. I've been getting limpias ever since I learned how to say the word. This little egg is tasked with a big job. It's supposed to absorb all the negative energy that's ever been afflicted on me. Or at least that's what my dad says. He moves pretty quickly with the egg. He goes up and down, side to side. He kind of looks like an artist, making sure to paint every corner of a canvas. He's channeled all his energy and good spirit into this tiny object that he says will protect me from bad vibes. So he's pretty focused. He's reciting a prayer in Spanish, asking God to protect me from any evils that may come my way. After about three minutes, the cleansing is done and every bad intention, vibe, energy, or even thought is trapped inside this egg. He takes it to a glass of water and then cracks the egg in the water. He brings the concoction of egg and water up to the light to get a better view of the way the yolk and egg whites float. He's trying to see if the egg absorbed anything negative. Kind of like a scientist looking at a solution in a beaker. He's been doing this for decades, so he knows ojo, or another name for bad vibes, when he sees it. See the little spikes? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. bad energy. Bad energy, like... I got ojo, so you're trying you, got, to... you got some ojo, yes. My dad says I picked up some bad energy. Well, at least that's what the egg told him. The only way to get rid of this negativity, on this scale at least, is to dispose of it properly. Now flush it. That's me, dropping the egg full of water in the toilet so that it's gone forever. I've been doing this for years, getting cleansed by my dad, and always feel lighter after. But for something on a larger scale, you can't just flush away the bad energy. Sometimes, You have to burn it all down. I'm Jackie Ibarra, and you're listening to the fifth episode of Season 3 of Darkness. In this podcast, you've learned about Mark Kilroy, a bright young college student robbed of a future. You heard from his family during their journey to find answers in his disappearance and death. You heard about Adolfo Constanzo, the charismatic leader of the cult responsible for Mark's death, and the deaths of at least a dozen other people. You know by now that the ranch burned down because law enforcement wanted to cleanse the place of all the evil it carried, just like my dad cleansed me. In this episode, you'll learn more about what came after, the arrests, the fallout, and the light that comes from darkness. As an anthropologist, Dr. Tony Zavaleta has seen a lot over the years. He's traveled the world documenting different folk religions, including Palo Mayombe, what Adolfo Constanzo and his followers practiced. He's seen plenty of things that most people in the United States would find pretty abnormal. But in April 1989, he didn't expect it would appear in his backyard. So after the dust settles with the investigation, Like a good anthropologist, he loads up his camera and makes the short drive from Brownsville, Texas to Matamoros, Mexico to document what happened at Rancho Santa Elena. We got there. There was, there, was no, there was absolutely nobody there. He takes photos of everything. He's amazed that none of the evidence of the cult's Paulo Mayombre practices has been removed. The enganga, the cauldron Constanzo and his followers used, is still there in the little shack on the property. He didn't realize that later that day, it would all be gone. As he's taking photos, he realizes he has company. And I noticed one of those, uh, uh, you know, the train of big black Suburbans turned while we were there, turned off the highway and came flying down the dirt road about 
half a mile. And I, I, I turned to my friend and I said, we're about to have some visitor, law enforcement visitors. I hope they're law enforcement. He knows some of the Hernandez drug gang members are on the run. Sara Adrete, his former student, is one of them. So is the leader, Constanzo. So he's really worried when he sees the suburbans. Until he spots a familiar face. I was very uh, happy to see George Gavito jump out of the verb suburban. And he, of course, said, Tony, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you know, George, I'm taking photographs. And he said, well, well get, get out of the way. Don't, don't be involved here, and we'll see what happens. So the, the Comandante Benitez was also there with an, old, with an old man. And I was told, I was told, because I asked, what is the old man's role? What is he going to do? And they said, he's a witch, and he's going to cleanse this place and burn it to the ground. It might sound odd, the idea of police bringing in this witch to a very active crime scene. The proper term to describe him is a curandero, or a type of spiritual healer. Curandero specialize in folk medicine and healing, and a lot of times, cleansing evil just like my dad did for me. They, you know, the Mexican police are very superstitious, extremely, highly superstitious. And I'm sure that uh, Comandante Benitez and all of the local law enforcement of Matamoros, I'm sure that they believed that there was this huge power and force out there that was going to, that was going to get them. Back when they first followed Serafine onto the ranch, the Mexican police didn't even want to set foot into the shack until it was cleansed. There's even rumors that the comandante had garlic all around his office to ward off evil spirits. You heard Gavito tell the rest of the story at the end of the last episode. The curandero burned the shack and all its contents to the ground. There's one thing investigators have left to do, and that's to find Constanzo and the rest of the cult members. It's Saturday, May 6, 1989. Adolfo Constanzo has been on the run ever since investigators found more than a dozen bodies on Rancho Santa Elena about a month ago. He's in an apartment in Mexico City, along with Sara Trete and five other members of his cult. In researching this case, I heard all kinds of things about what happened in Mexico City that day. Some stories say that Sara Adrete herself tipped off the police that Constanzo was hiding there. Others say police responded to the apartment building for an unrelated disturbance. Some of our sources told us that at one point, Constanzo started throwing money out of the window of the apartment, and that's how police found him. But I think the most likely scenario is that police had been closing in on Constanzo for a while. Police suspect him in a series of other deaths in Mexico City. The victims all had their spinal columns removed. Just like Mark Hilroy. Police collect tips from people who have spotted Sara Adrete or the other gang members, and they follow Constanzo's right-hand man, nicknamed El Dubi. They follow this gang member to an apartment in the Colonia Cuauhtémoc neighborhood of Mexico City. It's one of the nicest neighborhoods in the city. The apartment building stands five stories tall and is generally unassuming. It's a yellowish tan building with brick accents at the intersection of two narrow roads. Street vendors line the sidewalks. They see El Dubi walk into the building. Police swarm the area. They wait to make their move, but Constanzo spots them first. Here's investigator George Cavito. So he gets one of the machine guns and he starts shooting out of the room. So the cops come and they show up and then they see all these cop cars. So he starts throwing money. He starts throwing money out of the, out of the windows down. Constanzo had burned the money on the stove and tossed the ashes out of the window. He also throws heavy gold coins. The gun battle lasts about 45 minutes. 
Constanzo and his followers fire at the police and officers fire back. Constanzo was hiding with his boyfriend, a cult member who was one of his many lovers. During the shootout, Constanzo gave his right-hand man, El Dubi, an order. Constanzo wanted El Dubi to shoot him and his boyfriend. So, uh, when all this is going on, the police hit the, the building there, they go upstairs, Sada and them go to the top floor, they go and arrest them. When they come back, Constanzo and his boyfriend are dead in the closet. But he had like 60 bullet holes in him, and so did the other guys. Afterward, a police officer at the scene would tell the Los Angeles Times that Sara Adrete ran out screaming, quote, he's dead. They killed him. He's dead. By now, George Cavito has been working this case for months. It's like nothing he's ever been through. So you can't blame the guy for what he thinks when he arrives in Mexico City after the shootout. When we got there, I told him, I want to see the body. I said, this guy might not even be dead, man, you know? He wants proof that it's actually all over. So he and the customs agent, Oranek, go to the Mexico City morgue. It's like four stories down, you know, and we're walking down there, and, and Oren, Oren is with us, and, and, uh, and another guy from the customs is with us, and he had the camera and we're walking, and as we're walking, we see these rooms, and they're just bodies and bodies. We, Mexico City is the largest city in the world. I mean, and this is the only place they do autopsies, you know? Orin next, a customs agent. He's not used to seeing this type of scene. So by the hour, Nick started to, started to lose it. You know, he said, you know what? I'll wait for you guys outside, man. He turned around and didn't get the hell out of there. Cavito and the other customs agent carry on into the depths of the morgue. And what they see catches them off guard. It's a room full of dead bodies and the folks examining them because they do multiple autopsies at once here. And they got 15 teams uh, working. And they're doing different autopsies. And then they got, back then, and I'm sure they do it a little different now, they had a guy up there sitting up there, one up there, one up here, one four guys with typewriters, and they would go, stretcher number six, his liver weighs so much, and this and this, and then you got all this blood that's just running, and running, and running, and my God, we were in there, and oh my God, what am I doing here, you know? I've been to autopsies before, but one, not, not, not 30 at the same time, you know, and, and the smell was something else. But once Gavito's able to get past the stench and the strangeness of the scene, he sees him, Adolfo Constanzo, lying on the autopsy table. Gavito knew Constanzo had a unique tattoo. For weeks, he fielded phone calls from people who claimed to have seen Constanzo, but none of those people had seen a tattoo. But now, there it is, on his right arm. The tattoo of Katie Ompempe, the spirit which represents death in Balamayombe. Gavito feels, for the first time in months, relief. I don't know why I had a funny feeling that this guy had so much money, you know. Hey, tell him I'm dead. Tell him, tell him I got killed. I wanted to be sure. There's no doubt about it now. Constanzo, also known as El Padrino, is dead. And several members of the gang including Sara Adrete, are sitting behind bars, waiting for their sentencing. Here's some archival TV footage about the trials. The suspects will face a judge in a series of legal proceedings. There are no jury trials. The maximum federal sentence in Mexico is 40 years. The death penalty has been abolished. It can take anywhere between a few weeks to a few years for defendants to get their day in court. But regardless, the majority of the gang isn't on the streets or hiding somewhere in Mexico anymore. That provides some relief to the cities and citizens they terrorized, but not completely. Gossip and chatter start emerging that the cult was bigger than police initially thought and that members are still out there. Here's Dr. Tony Zavaleta again. Uh, many members of the gang were never caught. 
they're still out there. They were never they were never caught. And today today in, in the in the narcotics cartel of today, they're much, much more ruthless and murderous than they ever were back in those days. And so I was I was worried about my family, myself. Yeah. There's no way of knowing exactly how many members were in the Hernandez drug gang or the cult, but word gets around that at least two are still on the run and that there could be even more still hiding. Since he's an expert on the religion the cult practice and he taught Sara Adrete, he's appeared on a lot of news reports and TV shows both locally and nationally. Which means a lot of people, both good and bad, know his name and face. Now I can tell you that I, st- I, c- I came to a point where I stopped doing interviews. There were, there were a, a couple high profile uh, programs that were done that I participated in, George participated in, uh, that I thought were okay, but, but um, news, newspaper things, no, I stopped doing I stopped doing that because I didn't think it was safe. And I haven't in a long time. All these years later, he's not as worried as he used to be, but his guard still seemed up. I carried a gun, but I worried very, very much about uh, being attacked. And I was all attacked. I was always looking over my shoulder and worried that that was going to happen. But back then, Zavaleta wasn't the only one who felt scared. Since then, rumors about more bodies more ranches, and more kidnappings, and concern for what's next and how to protect the children. Listen to nine-year-old Victor Martinez outside church. My grandma and grandpa were telling me about that Michael Kirway, that they killed him, and um, um, I started getting scared, so I, I, so I went to my bedroom and laid down and started crying about it. I started getting scared. That's archival TV footage from just a couple of days after the bodies were discovered. You can hear how scared this little kid was. After all, this is a community deep-rooted in their Christian faith, and now there's talk about devil worship, cults, human sacrifice, mutilated bodies. They don't feel safe. Not anymore. A rumor spreads that the cult is planning to kidnap children in retaliation for the arrests. Some parents in Brownsville pull their kids out of school. Like I've mentioned often in this podcast, these communities are super religious, but they can also be very superstitious. I grew up in a Mexican family myself, and even my family is superstitious. That's why you heard my dad doing that egg thing at the beginning of this episode. My family is a little anxious that I've been reporting on the story. When I first started working on the story, my mom gave me a tiger's eye. It's a type of crystal that protects you from evil. She also gave me a tiny jar filled with things that look like tiny red rocks. I'm still not entirely sure what the red rocks are. My mom doesn't even know. She swears they will protect me and she insists I carry them with me. I've laughed it off, but still. I've carried them in my backpack ever since. They're just close enough for their protective force field to reach me. Superstitious? Yeah, but I figure it doesn't hurt to give it a chance. So that tells you a little bit about what the Brownsville and Matamoros communities might have been feeling. So many people there are scared and shocked after the Hernandez drug gang turned murderous cult was captured. To add fuel to the fire, on the night of a press conference held after the arrests, a member of the gang, Sergio Martinez, reveals to the police that he knows where another body is buried on the ranch. Police take Sergio back to the ranch and force him to dig up the body of the 13 victim himself. With the news of this additional victim, law enforcement and the people of Brownsville and Matamoros worry just how many more bodies are out there. But still, others hope these rumors about more bodies were the answers they've been looking for. 
Since Mexican police dug up 13 mutilated bodies this week at the Santa Elena Ranch, dozens of Mexicans have trekked hundreds of miles to the Matamoros morgue. They search desperately for their missing loved ones. The morgue is small and looks like a church, like the one shaped in a triangle, and it has these sort of stained glass windows. It sits in the central part of the city of Matamoros, just 14 minutes from Brownsville. From the pictures and videos I've seen, it looks like it can hold just a few bodies, so they're not really prepared for this influx of bodies from the ranch. Here's a reporter translating for the director of the morgue. I've been here 15 years, the morgue director says. What's happened this week in Matamoros is insane. It's one family's turn to go inside the morgue. Juanita Aprubel covers her mouth and nose, looks away, and then steps forward with her family in a chamber filled with death. They're looking for their missing son. Juanita and her family step inside this room. It looks sort of like a doctor's office with white walls and floors. Fluorescent lights flood the room as the family steps closer to the bodies. The bodies are wrapped in tarp, side by side, on the floor. The family steps closer to one body, clutching fabric over their noses. The morgue's director instructs them to find identifying marks. Her husband, Jesus, points to his arm, perhaps recognizing a birthmark. Where are his clothes, he asks. We know him by his shoes. The director responds, he was found naked. Jesus says his son disappeared 18 months ago. You think he ended up at the ranch, we ask? Even more families wait outside the morgue. Some are dressed in black. Others are holding up pictures of their missing loved ones. The family of Ruben Bella Garza just learned he was abducted, tortured, and mutilated at the ranch. An older woman, dressed in black, tells the reporter about her godson, Ruben. In between tears, she says that Ruben wasn't the kind of man who would get into any trouble. He was my godson, she says. He was a nice young man. Although Ruben's family got an answer, Lots of other families won't find their loved ones or get any type of closure. You love podcasts. The stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. In 1964, more than two decades before Mark Kilroy disappeared in Mexico, the country started a database to track the number of missing persons. It's called the National Registry of the Disappeared, and it's updated pretty regularly. By 2022, that number exceeded 100,000 people. It's a chilling statistic, and it's one that's expected to keep climbing. In Mexico, missing persons reports often go uninvestigated by police, which leaves the families of the missing people to their own devices. They search, ask questions, retrace steps, and sometimes even start digging. Even now, in 2022, countless groups of everyday people have formed to search for their missing loved ones. There's one made up of women, mostly mothers, who venture out into different parts of Mexico to search for their loved ones. When Mark was found, so were the bodies of at least a dozen people, all males. The youngest was believed to be 14 years old. 
Mark Kilroy was terribly unlucky and, and it never should have happened to him. But he was just the last of dozens of men who were killed, whose names never got reported. In fact, the police down there didn't even want to release their names to us, and none of the American reporters were pushing for them. This was Kilroy and nameless, faceless young men no one cared enough about to look for before the white guy got killed, right? That's Siva Varyanathan the former reporter who covered this story for the Dallas Morning News back in 1989. I ended up wondering a few things, some pretty deep things, like why did it take an American University of Texas student to go missing for anybody in Mexico to care about this, this slaughter, right? There had been dozens of young men missing. Their families, I'm sure, had been asking about them. Nobody bothered looking. But the moment the U.S. consulate starts asking, can you help us out? Uh, We've got this missing student. Um, Oh, immediately, it was so easy to find this branch, this gang. Siva isn't wrong about officials not putting much effort in. But it also wouldn't be fair to say that there wasn't anybody searching for these other missing people. Like I told you, so many families came straight to Matamoros in hopes of finding their loved ones after hearing about the ranch on the news. And like I said, most of the time, it is the families and not the police that go to great lengths to find their missing loved ones. It's just that most times, these families don't have nearly the same amount of resources as a family that is American middle class, and white would have. And certainly not the amount of media attention. There are a lot of things we don't know about the dozens of other men who were found alongside Mark. I wish we did, but reporting on an international case like this is bound to have some holes. What we do know, though, is that those other people were exactly that. People. People who were sons or brothers or fathers or friends. People who had dreams, just like Mark. But one universal truth is that without Mark, these bodies would not have been found, and some families would not have gotten the closure they deserved. But the Kilroys, at least, were able to find their son and give him a proper funeral. They found refuge in Brownsville within the walls of a local Catholic church with their own church nearly 400 miles away. So when they got the news about Mark, they knew they wanted to have a mass for him in the church with the congregation that had become like family to them, St. Luke's Catholic Church in Brownsville. St. Luke's is a pretty big church. It's got your typical Catholic church feel. Long wooden pews, stained glass windows, a giant cross, weekly mass. But the mass here tends to be a bit more vibrant than your typical service. I added in the mass was the mariachi. Then the mariachi uh, was uh, like an invitation to the, celebrate a joyful mass. That's Monsignor Nicolau, the priest you heard from earlier in the podcast. He likes for masses and church services to feel like a celebration with lots of music and singing and joy. So when it was time to have a mass for Mark, he wanted it to be exactly the same thing. A celebration. On that day that we celebrated the resurrection of Mark, everybody was singing. Él está vivo, él está vivo, with trumpets, guitars, voices, children, young people, old people. Everybody get together singing, he is alive. And it was joyous. There was mariachi music blaring and a choir singing off to the side. There were these big, beautiful arrangements of yellow and purple flowers with yellow ribbon wrapped around them. Big, bold, glittery letters read, We love you, Mark and Mark's photograph stood in the center. I'll never forget, the church was packed with people. It was like standing room only. And there were even people outside, and, you know, probably people that they didn't even know, but people came out to 
you know, to, to be with them. That's Leti Fernandez, the TV reporter from Brownsville. She was at the Mass as a journalist, but also as a friend. There were also a lot of cameras there, but mostly the room was full of people from the community. Some of them were friends who got to know the family, like Monica Rodriguez Davis and her family who lent their home to the Caroys while they searched for their son. There were others who didn't even know Mark or his family, but felt their pain and wanted to be there for them. Here's Monica. It was just remarkable how many people showed up and just complete strangers in the community that were just bawling at this mass. And I just, you know, thought it was just amazing because you're just, your heart, all these people, all of Brownsville felt for this couple and this family. And um, they felt like it was their own son or their own brother. Monica was 17 when all this happened, not all that much younger than Mark. After the music and the guitars all faded out, and it's just silence, Monsignor Nicolau gives his sermon. Drug dealers, drug addicts, criminals killed the body of Mark but they were not able to kill his spirit. The Caroy family sits in the front row, nodding and listening to Monsignor Nicolau deliver the rest of his sermon. They're not crying, but Helen is clutching Jim's hand. They're still wearing yellow ribbons for Mark. Jim and Helen speak at the Mass, too. They thank everyone for their prayers and their help in the search for their son. They also ask people to pray for the other victims and to not forget about them. When I interviewed Monsignor Nicolau, he made sure to remind me that he's 84 years old now and that there are some things he forgets. But not that Mass. I'll never forget that Mass. I'll never forget so many, so many days that we stayed together. Jim writes in his book that the Mass at Brownsville was a moment he'll remember forever. And he writes that Helen saw a reflection of her own sadness that day in the church. Mark's funeral was held in the same church he grew up attending back in his hometown of Santa Fe, Texas. Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic Church. Just like the Mass in Brownsville, it was also packed with Mark's friends, family, and what felt like his whole town. Santa Fe, Texas is a pretty small town, and when the news of Mark first broke, the whole town came together to help. They organized fundraisers and raffles to help raise money for the family, and yellow ribbons became their symbol of hope. On the day of his funeral, yellow ribbons were everywhere. On the trees outside of the church, on the mailboxes of houses leading into the city, telephone posts, on radio antennas on cars, outside of businesses, and on the chests of the people who loved him. The whole town was yellow. Just for Mark. The church was so packed for the funeral, there were tents outside with speakers to accommodate the amount of guests mourning the loss of Mark. A giant wreath, about 10 feet high, sat outside the funeral surrounded by 60 pots of yellow chrysanthemums, a flower that's supposed to symbolize love and light. Inside, people squeezed into the pews, and the church was filled with even more flower arrangements. Pictures of a smiling Mark and mementos from his life were scattered on a table in the front of the church. A teddy bear wearing his high school logos on it, some newspaper clippings from Mark's time as a star basketball player, pictures with girls he's dated, group pictures with his friends and from prom night, and index cards with kind words written about him from his friends. Memories of a life that was just starting and got too short. But the whole service was all yellow and bright and happy. Even the Kilroys dressed in light colors because although they were mourning, they were happy Mark was finally home. Mark's burial would be private. Just the family and the priest that had known Mark since he was an altar boy. 
In a cemetery in Galveston, the Caravoys hugged the urn containing Mark's ashes tightly, and each took turns saying goodbye. One last time. When Jim started his search for his son, he only cried once. It was the time he was pleading to the public about how he just wanted to hold his son again and how much he wanted him back. And after months of searching and fighting, Jim finally held his son again. It took a long time for these cities and communities to process what happened. But it took an even longer time for them to move on. But even so, Brownsville and Matamoros never fully recovered after what happened. I told you about how Brownsville is a border town and how a lot of people grew up crossing back and forth into Matamoros. But after the murders, the people who used to never really be scared before were nervous. Here's Letty, the TV reporter again. I mean, even a year later, I mean, you saw a sense of maybe there were maybe less spring breakers and there was a, or there was a sense of uh, encouraging kids not not to go across the river or be careful or so you saw a little bit of that but um i mean there was definitely awareness i mean i remember that they just couldn't they couldn't believe that happened over there you know that that was actually what took place you know but Matamoros was a city that thrived off their nightlife and the spring breakers. The discovery at the ranch, coupled with the increasing cartel violence, changed the city. For the people who grew up in these communities, watching the aftermath of an incident like this hurt. Oscar Casares, the Brownsville essayist you heard from earlier in this podcast, grew up doing the same things spring breakers do even hitting the same bars and clubs. He knows how lively the bars and clubs were in Matamoros before Mark and how jam-packed it was. But he also saw how much it changed after Mark died. It's been 30 plus years and and that shock wave of of what happened to with uh, Mark Kilroy is still felt and Matamoros never recovered in that regard. Never recovered. I mean, there are probably students who still go over but not to the degree that it was uh, up until that point, up until the late 80s, early night, or early 90s, uh, where it was just, there were just hordes, hordes. I mean, it was just like they blocked off the streets and there were just <laughs> thousands of, of kids, you know, school, college students. Uh, just going up and down the street, and it was just, they, they took over that part of the city, right? Uh, and that that just got, I mean, you know, for years and years, I think it, it didn't happen. I, I don't know if it's come back some, but, but I doubt that, it's, that it ever got back to where it was back then. But it wasn't just about their dwindling volume of spring breakers or newfound hesitancy into a place they used to feel so good about going to. When the Matamoros murders happened, it also opened the door for racism and discrimination. There's an incident mentioned in Jim's book about a billboard. There was a billboard in Santa Fe written in Spanish. Many people didn't know what it was advertising, just that it was in Spanish, which felt scary to them after everything that had happened. But the thing it was advertising? A church service. Even now, in 2022, there's still a lot of misconceptions about the border and its safety. Sure, the border and these communities have changed a lot since 1989, and like I told you before, drug cartels and violence exploded over the last 20 years. Here's Oscar again. The thing is that even when it is safe, it could change, (laughs) you know? Within the next hour, it could change dramatically. And if you're, if you happen to be on the wrong street at the wrong time, you know, um, yeah, I mean, something, something bad could, could go down. It can drastically change. Even recently, violence at the border city of Tijuana erupted after years of quiet and peace. 
cartel-related violence has even made its way to the previously safe resorts in some of Mexico's most touristy cities. But that's just the thing. The border is a complex thing, and it's hard to define. But the moment bad things happen on the border, or by the border, are the times people ever hear about. The, the unfortunate thing is that, you know, those sorts of incidents tend to get a lot of attention and the, the, the everyday stuff doesn't, you know. And I think this is, um, you know, one of the issues with the border itself, um, you know, all the media that could fit into uh, Brownsville and Matamoros went down for that, for that tragedy. Uh, as they have for other tragedies that, that have occurred there and, and along the border. But otherwise, they don't. They don't. But there's so much more to the border than the bad things. There are some things about it that you may not know about unless you've experienced it yourself. Like how it always smells so good from whatever food a street vendor is selling, or how the walls of stores and buildings are more colorful, or the way people are so friendly, or how it connects people to their homes, or in my case, to my grandma, or connects people to a country that has so much to offer. But when bad things happen, communities and cities get judged. They, so what ends up happening is that uh, people you know, away from the border, whether in, in Texas or, you know, just a, in, in the U.S. And, and, and abroad, they get one version of the border. And that version is, it's very dangerous. It's, uh, there's this, there's, there's drug cartels running rampant and uh, asylum camps everywhere and just, you know, everything that you can imagine uh, that would scare somebody away is down there and just waiting for you. Uh, you know, which couldn't be further from the truth. Those things do exist, uh, but they, they are the, the, the sort of the exception to, to what happens down there. When I started working on this story, I was a few months shy of my 21st birthday. Mark Kiro and I share the same birthday, March 5th. I've been thinking about this day since I was a tiny freshman in college back in 2019. Literally, I've dreamed about getting to show my new vertical ID to the server at Applebee's when I'm finally able to order a margarita. So to say I've been counting down the days is an understatement. But as the days inched closer and closer to my birthday, I couldn't really think so much about what I wanted to do. I could only think of Mark Kilroy, of how he too would have been celebrating his birthday just weeks before he died. How excited he would have felt, how he probably would have been counting down the days just like I did. Call it a coincidence, call it fate, or if you're like my Mexican superstitious family, call it a sign. But I see myself in parts of Mark's story. If I hadn't turned 21 during the COVID-19 pandemic, I would have probably have traveled somewhere like South Padre Island or even Mexico. I would have drank with my friends on a beach somewhere to celebrate the milestone of turning 21. It would be great to spend a week forgetting that I'm a student with homework and responsibilities. That's all that Mark wanted. We both got asked, what are you doing for your 21st? We both got to drink our first legal drink. We both got to blow out candles with our families, but only one of us got to go home. This was a hard story to tell. It's a heavy story with a horrible ending. Even now, 33 years later, this story lives on, especially in the minds of the people who remember the Kilroys and who remember the impact this story had on them. Here's Letty again. The horrible story, the horrible stuff that happened, 
the awful stuff that happened to him and to the others. And it's, it's hard not to escape that or to forget about that. But also, um, they never giving up, the family never giving up to try to find their son. And the sadness of that and... and I think those, I don't think I'll ever forget any of that. Well, when the sadness of it. And, um, and here it is 30 years later. And Mark continues to live on in the lives of the people who fought for him and prayed for him, like Monsignor Nicolau. I am asking uh, Mark to pray for me from heaven because yeah, yeah, I don't have too many years yeah, on this land. I want to go yeah, beyond the, the sun, Masaya del Sol. I'm going there, and I'm like, and uh, I'm very excited to meet him again. This is a story about darkness and the people who come out of it. But it's also a story about people like Monsignor Nicolau, who, at the end of our phone interview earlier this year, made sure to pray for me, a girl he's never met in person just like how he prayed for Mark. I'm going to give you a blessing, okay? May Almighty yes. God bless you and keep you. May he give you his peace in, going, in your going out and your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor, in your leisure, in your laughter, in your tears, until you come to stand before Jesus in that day which they neither sun right nor sunset. Que Dios te bendiga, mija, el Padre, el Hijo y el Espíritu Santo. Pray for me. This season of darkness is reported, hosted, and produced by me, Jackie Barra. Katie Penchik-Alka and Robert Quickly are the executive producers. This podcast is presented by The Drag, a student-run audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Moody College of Communication. Sewa Olivares is the lead sound designer and editor for this season of darkness, and the assistant editor is Heather Stewart. Special thanks to Marian Navarro for being the lead reporter on this story when this project first began. The associate producers are Emily Rubin, Megan Kirby, Jake Herman, Khadija Balde, Bethany Stork, and Miranda Vilches. The artwork was designed by Helen Halsey and Alexa Georgilos. Sofia Vargas Caram is the Drag's marketing and communications manager, and Grace Robertson is the Drag's PR manager. Christian McDonald is our technical director. Special thanks to Bob Buckaloo at KVU TV in Austin for all his time and effort finding archival footage for us to use in these episodes. And thanks to KVU for letting us use the audio. A huge thank you to Leslie Schrock for all her support and guidance. We also want to thank Jay Bernhardt, David Reif, Rachel Davis Mercy, Allison Dawson, and Kathleen Mabley of the Moody College of Communication. The Drag is a nonprofit educational organization that is made possible by donors like you. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com slash donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students like me an amazing educational experience. Thank you.